know I'm getting ahead of myself here. Let's go back in time a little bit. This project all started because of a research report. While I was taking a native arts class, I had to do a report on clinket weaponry and warfare. I found a book that contained several detailed figures on some of the weapons that they used, including double-headed daggers. I thought the illustrations were gorgeous, but then I actually saw artifacts in the Anchorage Museum. And after seeing them in real life, I decided that I wanted to try and build one. Even though metalsmithing class didn't start until January, I started on plans months in advance because I knew this would take a lot of time, and I wanted to get started as soon as possible. After we get permission from Jack, the studio professor to build the dagger, we first drop the patterns and then choose the steel. For this dagger, we'll be using Damascus steel, which has some very nice patterns in it. The patterns are cut out, it's time to put them to the steel. This takes a bit of careful lining up, so we don't waste a lot of the steel. But after we're sure the patterns will line up, we paint the entire piece of steel with ink, overlay the pattern on top, and then use an etching tool to scratch the ink around the edges of the pattern. This makes a line that is much easier to cut along. For this project, it was recommended that I etch and cut the two ends of the dagger as one instead of separate pieces. This would make it much easier to keep the whole dagger uniform. After we put angles on the edges, we'll separate the blades, but for now, they'll remain together. Now it's time to cut the dagger out. To do this, we use a bandsaw, which allows us to cut uniformly and cleanly. You have to keep a decent amount of pressure on the steel to keep it moving through the saw. And it does take quite a long time, but eventually it gets cut out the way you want it. Because someone cut from the same steel block once already, the sides aren't even. To fix this, we'll use a belt sander, which actually cleans up the sides fairly quickly. And with fire. After the sides are smooth and even, we'll use a hydro grinding wheel to add the dagger's edges. This specific wheel is set up for adding angles. It uses a clamp that holds the blade at specific angles. It's smooth, precise, and also extremely slow. Not that slow is bad, but it does take a long time when you're doing a double-headed dagger. Twelve hours later, I have one edge out of three. In the end, it took about 40 hours to do the entire dagger. Partly because the wheel is slow, but also because you have to do specific strokes that change depending on how far you've ground down into the steel. You have to do this because the end wears faster than the rest of the blade, so you have to do it last while still trying to get a paper-thin edge and similar knife angles. So here's the blade with the finished ends. But they all came out pretty good. We'll see what Jack says tomorrow if he's in. So I talked to Jack, and um, first he called me a rascal for getting it done so quickly. And then he told me it wasn't done. It turns out that you cannot have multiple facets on the edge, which this does, except for one edge. Now what I gotta do is I gotta go back to the grinding wheel, which I don't want to do, and uh, hopefully we'll get a nice uniform edge now. I'm really, really sick of that grinding wheel. So I thought I was done with the grinding, and then Jack told me the whole thing needs to be polished. Yeah, sandpaper. I have to sandpaper the entire thing. And I'm not talking like just a little bit. The whole thing needs to be clean, and all the lines on it, all the scratches, need to be gone. This is going to take a long time. Thankfully, it only took about four hours. But this polishing step is necessary if we want to get rid of the scratches that would otherwise be visible in the final product. After the blades are polished, this is when we'll separate the blades. Because of the way the blades were constructed, they didn't have a tain attached to them. So it would have to be built separately and then soldered onto the blades. The tain is built using a piece of round brass, the bandsaw, and a chisel.
Well, sometimes the brass needs a bit of encouragement. It takes a bit of jerry-rigging, but eventually your taint is formed. Then it's merely fitting and cleanup work. So, we're about halfway through this project. We've got the blades made. The tang's almost finished. Um, five injured fingers on top of it. All in the course of, I think it's almost 40 hours. Or close to it. It's probably more like 30. Somewhere between 30 and 40. And tomorrow, if I get this done, I think we're going to heat it up and quench it. And that's the part I'm most scared of. Because that's where it's most likely to break. It's definitely minimized by the fact that we're using oil and I'm using non-forged steel. But still, it's a big risk. Just hope God allows me to... Allows this thing to survive. So I couldn't film the actual hardening and tempering of the blade, but I can still demonstrate what we did. After we added copper to the ends of the blade so that the solder would stick better, we heated it up until it was red hot. And then we quenched it, therefore hardening it. But instead of using water, we used oil. And? Before we temper the blade, we have to clean off all the burnt oil. This is accomplished with steel wool and a vinegar salt solution. The latter, which gives some interesting results. So here's a bit of chem for you guys. So we use a type of flux that has copper in it, and we also put copper on the end of the blade so that the solder sticks better to it. Well, the problem is, is that when you put copper in a salt solution with vinegar like this, the copper tears off and then sticks to the steel, and it turns the steel pink. So right now, the blade is pink. Ish. It's like rosy colored. After the blade is clean, we then grind the excess solder off the steel. And use ferric acid to reveal the pattern on the blade. For the handle, I decided to use local alder wood that my dad and I cut together. Since I had to remove a lot of wood from the logs, it was recommended that I use a lathe to carve it down to the shape that I want. This dagger was going to have grips at the end, so the middle was hollowed out more than the ends. It was also important to make sure that this handle was going to fit my hand properly. We then split the wood, then determined where the tang should fit into the handle. This takes a little bit of measurement, and you have to be careful. If you're not, the tank could sit crooked in the handle, and that's no good. Looks pretty good! Once we're sure everything's centered, we have to carve out the middle so that the tang fits into the wood properly. Even though we know roughly how deep to go into the wood, we still have to be slow and precise. Just carving away a little bit at a time will do the trick, along with constant checking to see if it fits or not and continue to carve away as necessary. I got it! There we go! Snap together! Now it's time to cut the grips into the shape we want. Again, takes a lot of measurement. And cutting. Once we're sure of the shape that we want, we then use epoxy to glue it to the tang. We planned for the grip to be wrapped in leather, so we have to hollow out the middle a little bit more so that the leather will fit in there properly. This will also add some nice angles to the grips. So after all that shaping, all that planning, all that, the knife is pretty much done. You can see that I've put carvings into the uh, guards on both sides. Those are uh, Clinket form line art pieces, and I still haven't put Mother of Pearl inlay into them, but at least the carvings are done. Now it's time to build the sheath. And I have everything I need except the cedar. A cedar siding for a fence would be 
pretty good. It's five eighths of an inch. I mean, it would do the job. But I can't find any. <laughs> They're really, really hard to find. Someone told me that there were boards at the grocery store that you use to cook salmon on. They uh, cook salmon on cedar boards at times. It's actually pretty good. So I'm going to check there. I don't know if those are going to work or not. Otherwise, I'm going to uh, check this other store. They might have them. And we'll see where we go from there. The problem is, is it's going to be a really early morning. That has about three or four possible stores that I can go to, but the problem is, is that uh, it's a highly industrial area. You can even hear the trucks. You know, it's really busy. There's a lot of roads. There's a lot of factories in between all the stores. So there's quite a bit of walking to do. One store I've never even been to. I wonder how many people are wondering why I'm filming myself. This thing's even more expensive here. Well, they definitely have a lot more wood, and their stain is two cents cheaper, but, uh, I can't find any cedar. Found it! There's actually quite a few. To build the sheath, I'm going to be using a wedge technique, which involves using two similar halves with a quarter-inch wedge in between them. There's no room for error in this part of the project, so your measures, cuts, measures, cuts, measures, cuts, measure, cuts, everything has to be right the first time. And just like the handle, it's very important to take your time. So I threw it in and out. Actually, it's super nice. Really close. Once we're sure everything's right, we'll epoxy it together and clamp with tape to hold it in place. And then we have to wait a little while to finally glue the top on. Now we get to do it all over again. The big dagger is big enough to hold itself in place, but the small one isn't. To fix this, we add sunken magnets into the small sheath. And because after we glue it all together, it's square, we then use the belt sander to sand it down. So here's the big sheet. Uh, it's about the thickness that I need now uh, for all that sanding. About killed my lungs. It fits pretty well. It takes a little bit of jerry rigging to get it uh, to go in one way. I think after we do a little bit more sanding, I'll carve the rest of the motifs into the faces and we'll oil it. Boy, I can't believe it's only been two weeks. The project at this point had gone so well, I didn't think that adding shapes to the sheath would be so hard. Turns out I was wrong. So I've been here since 6. About 6 or so. It's not just past 10. I just undid all the work I did. But, you know, that's what happens. Um, it just didn't look right. Not sure what I'm going to do now, but... Anything's better than what I just did, because it was... It's all clean now! It's almost midnight. It's like 15 minutes to midnight, and I decided to go a bit more of abstracted route. So instead of doing the lion body, I'm doing a, just a bunch of uh, ovids and form lines. It's kind of disappointing that I, um, that I spent something like six hours trying to figure this out. But that's what happens when, you know, plans don't work out the way that they do, you come up with something new. The original plan was to carve everything out, but I'm looking at it now and I'm like, I don't know if that would look good. So I got a few decisions to make. Um, I'm thinking of not carving it out and just leaving it the way it is, oil it and call it good. The idea worked. But sorry guys. You don't get to see it until the very end, when the whole dagger is finally finished. Now it's time to add the grip, 
which is just plain brown leather. See, there's the end. <laughs> it's gonna be really, really close. <laughs> Just enough. Oh, it's like perfect. Nice, look at that. <laughs> We've now reached that point in the project where it's really all just finish work from here on out. We add Mother of Pearl inlay, and we clean up the blade. That's it. And it's all done. Finally.